Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful to um, Stephen for his excessively kind and undeserved words. Uh, and if I may say so, I'm also thrilled to see Dr. Ralph Smith here, who rather cunningly managed to time it exactly to his arrival just after his deputy had done brilliantly in, in the art of, um, of how you delegate or don't. <laughs> and the other thing, ladies and gentlemen, I've just discovered what it's like to be a broiler chicken, because, um, and, and, and one that, of course, isn't organic entirely, but sitting in here when we first came in, it reminded me so much of those large... Um, intensive chicken farms I've visited. Um, anyway, it's nice to see... It's nice to see such a high stocking rate of business leaders. And, if I may say so, particularly splendid to see so many members of business in the community here today, uh, and particularly heartening that so many of you have remained such loyal members um, despite the ravages of the recession. There were anxieties that quite a lot of you would disappear and uh, not want to, to get involved while things were so difficult. But the fact you've remained, so many of you, is, is remarkable, I think, and, and an enormous credit to you. And needless to say, I'm much looking forward to listening to the report back session of my um, Seeing is Believing program later, which really has proved to be such an effective means of informing business leaders uh, of their wider role in society. Its success, I think, is down to those who run it, and uh, I would just like to thank the leaders of the 2013 programme ahead of our meeting. Also to thank Steve Holliday and the 12 ambassadors he has led, who have helped demonstrate that the engagement work done by business in the community is key to defining the approach business has to take if we are to create uh, responsible business leaders of the future. And um, I cannot let this opportunity go by without um, also thanking Mark Price and the board he has chaired so brilliantly uh, for all that they have achieved with business in the community. And incidentally, I'm delighted that we have persuaded Mark, poor man, to remain as the chairman uh, at least for a short while yet. So, Mark, I can't thank you enough for being prepared to do that. And I'm particularly grateful to him and the business contributors to my Countryside Fund, whose cause-related marketing efforts since 2010 have enabled grants worth £3.87 million to over 120 rural communities. That is estimated, estimated to be around 64,000 people who in some way or other have been helped in rural areas alone. But, ladies and gentlemen, we do need more businesses and companies with direct links to the countryside, uh, its products and services to contribute. If Dutch originals could give 75,000 a year, so can others, I think, who are far larger in size. And incidentally, I was down in, um, in Somerset uh, uh, this week and just visiting some of the farmers who've been flooded twice now and we're all told it's just once in a hundred years and that's what um, one farmer was telling me that Lloyd's Bank had told him when they were very kind and helped him after he was flooded last year once in a hundred years now it's happening again but for weeks and weeks and weeks and what it does of course is to kill off the, the soil and you have to apply huge amounts of lime to try and bring the soil back again. And it's just perhaps a bit of a reminder, possibly, and a wake-up call that we have to take a longer-term view, because if you're going to grow anything or farm it, the weather is hugely important in all this. You can't just suddenly um, you know, remove the, the help from people. And therefore, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we need to pay a little bit of attention to the long-term issues that we're facing, which indeed has already been discussed, fortunately, this morning. And, ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard one example, I was going to say from Dr. Ralph Smith, uh, of a company doing all it can. Jaguar Land Rover, um, as business of the community's responsible business of the year for 2013, really does deserve our congratulations. 
And I was particularly struck by its commitment to developing apprenticeship schemes and its support for so many sustainable projects worldwide. And interestingly, the company has found this is not only the right thing to do, but drives innovation within the businesses and enables it to remain competitive. Business in the community, of course, has been at the forefront of forging this whole approach, and we now have plenty of proof that by participating in its programs and campaigns, companies have become much more mindful of the communities they serve, recognizing that good business is actually good for business. And of course, being a responsible business goes far beyond concern for the financial bottom line. Uh, running businesses, as you know far better than I, you are very much on the front line. What you do not only drives the economy, it is pivotal in creating healthy, stable, and therefore resilient communities without which society really has no hope. And if you think about it, uh, that very stability in society is what attracts so many investors to this country. If you ask them why they want to invest here, as I do from time to time on visits overseas. But, ladies and gentlemen, to maintain that stability, it surely has to be invested in. And that is why, as members, you play such a crucial role in helping to build resilience and skills in many of our more deprived and struggling communities. To that end, I, I must just thank Mark Boland for the tremendous leadership um, he has shown as chief executive of Marks and Spencer, which was business of the community's responsible business of the year in 2012, in encouraging large employers to invest in building these skills and resilience in young people. Mark's personal commitment to the Make Your Mark program has been invaluable, supporting an initial cohort of a thousand young people with hopefully more to follow next year. So thank you, Mark, very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I need hardly say that I am indebted to those companies which have seen the point of offering some of their professional skills via business connectors, for instance, to those in struggling communities so that they can master the means of helping themselves more effectively. And in this regard, it is enormously heartening that business in the community has announced today the secondment of its 100th business connector. And interestingly, um, Anglian Water uh, has extended the secondment of their Finland uh, connector for a second year because they uh, have seen such uh, uh, benefits in their local relationships by being part of the program. So that, I think, really is rather encouraging in terms of, of being able to keep this, this very valuable program going. So the idea of parachuting top business skills into disadvantaged areas has been incredibly effective, not just for the communities that have benefited from the knowledge and connections they acquire, but also for the companies themselves. But can we do more? Hardly surprisingly, I would say yes on all levels, particularly when it comes to establishing a more genuinely sustainable approach to long-term economic and human activity. And in such a constrained and pressured planet that, according to many expert scientists, has already seen us exceed its planetary boundaries, such an approach is becoming uh, desperately urgent. And going back to Jaguar Land Rover, it really is just one of the many companies that have contributed to thinking around sustainable marketplaces. But I cannot help thinking that linking the workplace to the kind of consumer awareness raised through, for instance, the START program we got going some years ago, could do much more to help transform thinking. If we have, what, 850 member companies here today that represent around 9 million employees, which is a huge constituency. So I wonder whether each of you would ever consider holding your own start type open days to your staff, retired staff, and their families. That's the point. Because if you involve 9 million people directly 
the chances are you reach twice as many indirectly. And it is a matter of just of recognizing how pivotal your position is in society. You are, after all, the catalyst for change, which is why the Future Leaders Programme, provided by the Cambridge Programme for Sustainability Leadership, in partnership with business and the community, is so important in its critically transformative work in helping, above all else, to build resilience. Funny, isn't it, how that word resilience has suddenly appeared as the new, the new word to be used in the last few days. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 29 years ago, when I now realize I first became president of business and community, and no one had had an interfering old busybody like me to get in their way, none of this got very far. Uh, however, perceptions seem to have changed a bit, and I'm relieved to say that the recommendations developed, for instance, by my accounting for sustainability project are being embraced by more and more of the finance community, both in the corporate world and by government departments. Embedding natural and social impacts within decision-making is no longer seen as economic madness. Organizations are starting to see that thinking about sustainability is necessary if they are to future-proof themselves against the mounting environmental and social factors that now threaten economic stability. Crucially, organizations are also improving the way they communicate uh, those integrated strategies with their stakeholders, and integrated reporting is now being adopted and supported by companies, investors, and regulators around the world. Of course, we still have a long way to go, and to that end, I am very pleased that my A4S project has formed a new partnership with business in the community, and I hope this will help drive the shift in culture so that it becomes the norm for businesses and their investors to think beyond the next financial quarter and have in mind the impact, their impact in the next quarter of a century and how this will impact their ongoing commercial viability. And ladies and gentlemen, with regard to long-term thinking and escaping from the conventional straitjacket of short-termism, I was particularly fascinated by a, a meeting I had recently with the CEO of the Dutch multinational Royal DSM. Under Feke Sibesma, 15 years ago, DSM began to refocus its operation completely onto a much more sustainable and responsible footing. It ditched its huge and profitable fossil fuel-based petrochemical businesses and turned to biotechnology and life science. And for example, by building uh, a $250 million plant in the United States, which converts organic waste that would otherwise be burned or go to landfill, it is concentrating on the manufacture of second generation biofuels that do not affect global food production in the way the first generation do. It is also developing technology to extract methane out of the atmosphere as well as CO2. But to do this, their CEO, CEO had to close the door on those investors who refused to take the long-term view. He told them it was the end of the circus, and yet DSM is now delivering to those investors who were prepared to do so the highest yields the company has ever seen. Increasingly, it is becoming possible to demonstrate that sustainability and healthy profit margins are not mutually exclusive but it does take vision and dogged determination. Dogged determination, of course, is what Sir Winston Churchill had back in the 1930s in the run-up to the catastrophe of World War II, when he faced, as we do now, a wall of denial and skepticism. And yet, the threats to economic stability we face today are arguably far greater than those faced in 1939, with climate change already making some parts of the world uninhabitable when once they supported healthy communities, and with global trends threatening to swamp local action, business has to recognize its role within society, which is why business and the community's idea of a new contract between business and society is so important. We could only achieve 
the transformation we need by encouraging enlightened business leadership to see that it's, see its relationship with society as a mutually beneficial partnership, one that puts in, in as much as it takes out, one that has its sights not just on profit, but on doing what business in the community stands for, releasing the untapped power of this country's social capital and nurturing a more balanced, more dynamic, and much more sustainable economy in the future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.